Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. This time, we're taking a trot down to sunny Florida with a guest that I'm sure many of you have heard before. We've got Ben here. Battle hey, what's Brother going? Ben, no less. Ooh, Battle Brother Ben. BBB, what's up, guys? Thanks uh, Thanks for having me on. It been feels like a long time in the making, but turns out wrangling three adults with busy schedules in different time zones is a little tough, huh? It definitely is. I mean, you're the king of different time zone wrangling. <laughs> I, I think we have a monopoly on the most difficult time zones in Kill Team podcasts, for sure. So that's our claim to fame. Man, getting a hold of the Australian scene was was rough, even for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet the different energies that we have is like Reese is just waking up. I'm just getting off work and Russ is like should be in bed. So the energy is all over the place. I think that's part of the recipe. Yeah, a little bit of chaos. It's a perfect cocktail. <laughs> of which you are a master of. Oh, listen, man, that's uh, I'm all about the chaos. I can't help it. It, it is just my way. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're recording this coming off of the backs of Tampa Open, where we had 40 plus people show up and, you know, basically all of your work in Florida culminating in a big tournament, right? It felt like, a again, it had nothing to do, the tournament was all GW, nothing to do with me, which was nice. I, I got to participate. But yeah, it mm -hmm. felt like a big payoff for sort of the hustling that, that I and, and some other folks have been doing in Florida, where we all got together under the same roof. Um, and, uh, and, and one of your guys, Adrian took it home, went undefeated, killed it. Um, but, but for Florida, the win was, we, we got uh, a Florida boy play second. So, you know, by default, you know, we'll take it, we'll take that win. Got, I uh, got a golden ticket. So that was, that's pretty big for us. We got a Florida boy in the, in going to worlds. So feels real good. Yeah. And we'll be talking a little bit about Nurgle Legionary and, you know, maybe not. So we can talk about the meta pick for the legionaries compared to all the non-meta picks that we've been talking about on the podcast as of late oh sure i've, I've been by the way guys i've been loving the legionary talk and uh so keep it up i'm, I'm here for it well you, today you're going to be a part of it <laughs> well, i'm honored thank you yeah but before we get into any of that you know we got a patreon call out for one of our new scout tier uh listeners robin van winkle thanks for signing up as a patron because now we're up to three patrons, which hey. is a, a big deal for us. Oh, that rules. Congrats. Yeah. How have things been going in uh, real life? I know, you know, obviously for you, the Tampa stuff is probably front of mind. But what has been going on non-kill team wise for you? Oh, man. Non-kill team stuff. Uh, hobby wise, I, I've been flirting with Necromunda um, a little bit just as a strictly for fun game. Um, but aside from that, man, I'm I'm a dad with with two girls. And so. I don't have a ton of time. I'm I'm pretty fortunate. I I get to I, I my job is I work at Warp Fire Minis. Um, so we we ship out minis all over the place. It's a really cool game store. So I get to get some of my games in on the clock, which is about the only way I can squeeze it in. So I'm lucky in that way. Um, but aside from that, Necromunda, and then a busy dad, man. So that's what I'm up to. How about you guys? I went to a Fred again concert over the weekend, and I think I might have gotten COVID. So. <laughs> Ooh, nice. Luckily, it's not too bad at this point, but I am like sequestered in my room. So if any listeners hear any differences in the sound setup on my part, that's why. Was it a good show? It was great. It was in the rain, which was great. Uh, it's <laughs> It was disappointing because on Friday there was no rain. And then on Saturday it started raining. So it was like a rainy tournament. Or I, it was, I had a tournament, a kill team tournament during the day where I played that guard and then I went to go to the concert and it was in the rain, which was fine and it was fun, but now I have a little bit of a cold. So it sucks. <laughs> that sucks. What about you, Jason? Well, um, I'm, uh, I've been dabbling. Uh, I've done another wave of making some of my own remixes, which has been Ooh. a lot of fun. And like making, um, I made a couple of little like demo DJ sets that I've been uh, sending up for promo material and just kind of having a lot of fun with that. Discovering some uh, deep cut funky tracks, which actually um, Ben had posted about on your Instagram. And we, we shared a couple of messages about our enjoyment of funky tracks. Oh, yeah. 
And, you know, maybe we'll drop one of uh, Jason's DJ mixes on the patron just for any of the patrons to listen to, right? That's definitely possible. Ooh, that would be sweet. Yeah, if you're in the Discord and you think that sounds fun, uh, let us know and we can make that happen. But it's up to you and your excitement, listeners. But yeah, I mean, you know, the key topic for the day is talking a little bit about Florida. And Ben, you, you know, when we we're doing the run up to this show, you wrote in the show notes basically that you had, you've been grinding it out in the scene. So I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit about how that worked. I guess working at a game shop definitely helps in that respect, right? Yeah, man, it, it's kind of funny how it all, it's funny how things just fall into place that you you don't expect. Uh, I, I've been working there for about a year, but before before I, was, I started working there, I was just a patron of the store because uh, I live in Ocala, Florida. Don't have don't have a ton going on. But we're about an hour from anything that you might want to do in Florida. Um, and so but we're lucky enough to have Warp Fire Minis, which is awesome game store ships all over the U.S., good prices, all that kind of stuff. So I was a fan um, and a patron for a long time. And I would just show up, man, with my kill team stuff and some painted terrain that, you know, I didn't paint, but uh, someone else did. So I was very grateful for that. Um, shout out to, to Drew, Drew K. He's a kill team player. He painted some terrain for me and sent it in. But I keep showing up because Florida has been a kill team dead zone for I'm mean, like years, straight up years. And so uh, I, I got started in last edition and there was nobody but my brother to play, basically. And he didn't really want to play that bad. So he kept showing up to the game store and making it happen. And for a while, man, no, nobody showed up, but we we stuck it out. We pulled through and eventually led to me getting a job there. So it's funny how things work out. So you're, you, you got the job or both of you have a job there? Oh, just just me. My my brother is not much into war games these days, but uh, but I I got a job through just showing up and you know I think being a nice guy and so uh, you know funny how things work out. It's been pretty cool. Yeah, that sounds really fun actually. Just being able to have your hobby be part of your day job. It really is lucky, man. I feel super lucky and having like the Battle Brothers channel, all that stuff, sort of tied in. And I'm I'm doing doing videos for them now. They're putting some videos out on Sigmar, so it's just you know life life is funny that way. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, you know, thinking about that dead period, what kind? What did you do when things were looking kind of slow? Because it sounds like maybe Kill Team Eighteen also didn't really take off in your area of Florida, or maybe Florida in general. Yeah, man, we just, you know, Florida, for, there's got there's some 40K and there's a strong Sigmar presence from from what I understand. Um, but Kill Team just really never caught on. And so I got in last edition before, before Pariah Nexus came and sort of <laughs> threw a monkey wrench into everything. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it was janky and weird and a, sort of objectively a bad game, but it was very fun and didn't have anybody to play with. So when the edition rolled around, I, I, I doubled down and I was like, you know what? We're going to stick this out and uh, and make it happen and just showed up and was focused on being a, a, big fun, a, a fun person to play against and having painted teams and all that stuff. And uh, eventually got some guys going and that sort of took off in our area and then put some efforts into uh, you know, connecting with the other pockets of isolated kill teamers in Florida in different areas. And and, and through that, they started building their own scenes and we united under the Florida kill team banner and now it's kind of blowing up and popping off. And now we got some really good players like, you know, Dawson uh, is, is one who who took took the golden ticket. We have a great player called Ben McMillan. I was bummed that he couldn't make it to the tournament because he's a monster as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's blowing up a little bit and feels really good. Yeah. Do you have your own discord that is like the Florida discord? We do. Yeah, we have the Florida Florida kill team server. And uh, I can I can get you a link to that if anybody's interested. But I think even maybe through I, I hopped in your guys server and somebody in Florida was looking for some games. We were able to get them connected. So it's cool, man. Like the community aspect is 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 very cool. And and we love love being good folks to play against and have a pretty healthy and um, welcoming and uh, environment and, and circle. So that's kind of what we're about. Yeah, that's great. One of uh, one of my the first players that joined my club in Minnesota um, was a guy named Matt and he actually moved to Florida and um, he's been talking about uh, playing games down there and he's invited me and uh, some other guys to go and one of my other friends ended up he did go down to that Tampa tournament but I had to work that weekend Alex right yeah yeah man it's such a small world 
uh yeah matt is just the nicest guy on the planet um he's great and i love to play him uh, i played him in the tournament he was he was one of my one of my two losses uh it, it came down came down to the wire i lost by a point he took it and uh with harlequin's band suck i hate harlequin so much but i love matt so shout out to matt he's one of the nicer dudes i've ever met yeah agreed yeah matt was there like every single week when i was launching the club in minnesota and um yeah so big shout out matt's a real one and he's been a huge part speaking of matt he's been a really huge part of getting the ocala scene ocala gainesville scene up and running because he just he he's one of those guys that he comes with all his teams he comes with his terrain if somebody wants a teaching game like he's more than happy to jump in and teach and teach like some some young guys uh like young kids kill team if they're interested so he, he's been a huge part of it for us yeah that, this is like our first uh beat our first hometown hero that made it to two different kill team scenes <laughs> that, that's yeah, an achievement unlocked two whole regions yeah it's pretty good two different time zones even he's he's cutting <laughs> he's gunning for the time zone thing ben well i'll put right in yeah yeah have you done any other kinds of events that you found have been able to bring new players into maybe the community aspect or has it mostly just been tournaments for you uh tournaments have been just the the best way for us you know like there's just something that happens when you have competitions running and you have sort of that that friendly competition spirit where folks want to come and do well and especially in florida where aside from the gw open the only like sizable ones have been the ones that we put on um and so hoping to hit 36 at our next our next tournament um but but we'll see it's not not on the calendar yet but we're we're getting there but that for us that's been the biggest one um i've been meaning to do a narrative campaign the same one that i ran for kto with a a few twists on it just for folks who want to have a good time but it really is we don't have much of a narrative scene all our guys are focused on on trying to get good you know as it were so Mm -hmm. so don't have a huge narrative group but that's something i'd like to do for fun in the future Yeah, I guess getting good is always the easy thing for everyone to kind of like unify together around, right? Totally. Yeah. Nobody wants to suck. You know what I mean? We're all on a journey to sucking less, ideally. Um, So, yeah. Speaking of sucking less for uh, the operative showdown. Ooh, uh, nice transition. Nurgle Legionaries. We talked about Nurgle Legionaries because we've talked about a lot about Zinch and Korn and Slanesh over the last couple weeks. So I'm curious to hear about someone who's still playing Nurgle Legionary. And you did you did pretty well at Tampa. 4-2 is a pretty respectable record. Losing to second place and Void Dancers, which is nothing to sneeze at. Yeah, man. The, yeah, the goal... Uh, my wins... Let's see. Uh, I played Intercession, which, again, man, as a Legionary player, give me all the Intercession. I'll take that matchup all day, every day. Uh, I played, this is pretty zany, I played my own teammate from Warpfire, who was running Justian, Strikeforce Justian, and uh, so just different intercession, uh, and then I played Hearthkin, which is, my god, dude, I, I got some reps in with against them before the tournament, what an awful matchup for power armor, they just hit you with four crits once you get your double kills going, um, and then my last win was against Hyrotech. And uh, a very fun match against a very fun opponent. So but those those are the wins. Nice. All right. I'm surprised. So you know, Votan right now, just as a as a tangent, Votan are one of those boogeymen for our Space Marine teams right now. So what what actually got you through that matchup? Oh man. So like the big takeaway for me, I've, I've been playing Legionaries for a, a long time, and I'm, I'm just this is Tampa is my second foray back into competitive like tournaments. Um, I was out for a long time because I was making videos and my videos have slowed down because of sort of what we're talking about, trying to get the community up and running, because that just felt like, you know, something that would we saw some some growth there, wanted to try and foster that. Um, But so it was my second foray back into competitive play. My big takeaway was that, man, with Legionaries, if you can get two double kills against like, you know, a 12 or less body kill team that's almost game right there, right there. You know what I mean? And so I was just able to get, uh, I dropped, dropped the heavy in that matchup because the boards are just so dense these days and obscuring is just so annoying. Um, with, with a team like legionary sometimes. So I took the icon with the crack and I got a double kill first activation turn two, and then was able to, you know, chuck a crack at his concealed, um, plasma beamer. And so that's two key operatives right there. 
And then I was able to take out his uh, somebody else and then his leader. I wounded his leader with someone else. And after that, man, that's it's hard to come back from. But even then, he still hit me with four crits from his his Melta gun that he has. So like that's just because the grudge token. So that is devastating. You you really can't take your foot off the gas against them because they will just hit you with crit city. Yeah, they they play kind of like Blooded, where at the end of the game they're just o- way overperforming on each operative, just because you yeah, have totally. like three grudges per enemy operative, which is great. Was he using yeah. a lot of plasma knives? I know Ace mentioned that he's all about the plasma knives, so curious if uh, that happened to you as well. In this matchup, I think he had plasma knives on one or two guys, but not not the full knife gambit that that you sometimes see. Okay, yeah. You know, for any struggling Votan players, it does sound like on Ace's side, he's a big fan of playing a lot of knives. So that means at the end of the game, every operative can do charge, fight, Ooh. shoot. So maybe maybe that would have been rough, right, Ben? Uh, yeah, totally. Like, those plasma knives are no joke. Le- lethal 5 plus grudge tokens. Again, it's kind of like Hand of the Archon, where they're just hitting you with so many crits. Like, what are you going to do about that? Nothing. Yeah, it means it means that in melee, you know, a random dwarf can reasonably threaten a uh, Nurgle legionary that's been taken taken a little bit of damage because your five damage back half of your knife is really good against Nurgle's Nurgle's mark. Yeah, and and it's like it's just economy wise, it's great because Nurgle is netting you nothing against that knife because three damage minimum damage like uh, your reduction, so you're getting the full strength of that knife. Like you're not going in any softer than you already are so it's awesome yeah all right but you know you're the big nurgle player here we've talked to we've had players come on and talk about corn and zinch but it sounds like you're also flirting a little bit around with non nurgle marks so i have a couple examples here for the operative showdown looking at you know maybe like the slanesh shrive talon versus a nurgle shrive talon so Ooh. are there situations where you would use one or the other and or is it just Nurgle most of the time just because it's so much safer? Ooh, that, that that's good. So I and I, I learned this this tech from Shane. He sort of blew my mind with it as as the true le- legionary lord himself um, is the the Slanesh Shrive Talon uh, into Gellerpox is awesome because you have the natively with a shrive talon you have uh, a way to reduce uh, an apl if you get a kill like within three inches um and then also i believe it's called sickening captivation is the ploy that you get with a slanesh mark where for a cp you can just automatically do that and so into two apl hordes that spe- specifically don't have like funny fallback shenanigans like Kasserkin will will screw you up on that because you'll minus their uh, their APL and then they'll just do the tactical retreat, whatever it's called, and and get somebody out of there for free. But against something like Wormblade or even Vet Guard, you just have to watch out for in Death Atonement, where you can charge to get a kill and then subtract an APL from the other one, uh, and then you're safe in combat effectively. But like Blooded doesn't work against because they'll just they'll, they'll blast you anyways. They don't care. Yeah, they'll, they'll just shoot into the melee, and they're like, all right, well, he's dead too, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't even matter. And then, like, on the Nurgle side of things, man, like, so the argument about the Zinch versus Nurgle, like, as long as you are typically, like, leaning heavy on one of those for most games, I think that's probably where the most value is. Um, but, you know, never being injured is good against every team. Like, having a four-up invuln is super sweet in some matchups. But never being injured is good in almost every single matchup. So yeah, really, um, really keeping your two health operatives still valuable, basically, right? It, it dude, that that's what saved me in a, a game versus Hyrotech is that uh, I had two guys s- straight up on two health, but my plasma gun still hit on twos, and my melta still hit on threes, and I was able to go in there and just and just do some work. Um, so like sometimes I will take the Shrive Talon depending on the mission. Uh, into intercessors like on loot or maybe even uh, secure because he can do the drop the drop his uh, grizzly tr- mark or whatever it's called. Grizzly I'm mark, bad with yeah. names. Yeah, thank you. I think it's grizzly mark. Basically, it just makes and makes it so that they have to manage the shrive talent in melee because you can just put it on conceal and sit on an objective, right? Yeah. Or, or prep to basically charge safely because the shrive talent five attacks on threes, three five can tango with any of their assault intercessors because you go first. Yeah, yeah, lethal five. And, and that's the key thing about the, the Shrive Talent for me is 
he doesn't win me games against three APL teams by charging in, but he wins wins games by holding a flank and getting charged. Because if you charge him, you're you probably are still going to die, even if you're an intercessor. Um, cause you're, you're now going down to three, five when, with your chain sword. Um, and I'm hitting on three, five with lethal five and I fight first. That's a bad time even for assault intercessors. Yeah. I think there's no real questions on whether or not your anointed should be Nurgle. Cause it's just, it's just too good if you're going to be using Nurgle, right? Oh man. So in Tampa, this is actually interesting. I, I agree. Yes. And it, so if I take Slanesh, it's really for the Slanesh Shrive Talon. But I, I, I took actually Nurgle Corn for the first time without much testing, okay. uh, which is a little little okay, weird nice. for me. Ballsy, and ballsy. I, ballsy. And I took it for specifically the Corn Anointed so he can take advantage of perpetual aggression. Um, okay. And it never came up. Never came up a single time. I, he came out twice. All the other games, he was Nurgle. Um, but I think there's absolutely some value in the ping pong. And like you guys talk about, Jason, I know you were talking about like the full corn ping pong list sounds so incredibly uh, fun. It but, is super um, fun. Yeah, it's just chain lightning through everyone. Yeah, it, that's so cool. But it never came up for me, <laughs> unfortunately. But I that's why I took it because, again, I wasn't super worried about teams like Geller Pox or something like that. Um, so I tried to shake it up. and But it, so it worked out. Thinking- so you took the corn anointed mostly because the double fight is baked in for free, right? So you could exactly. do a fight, free charge, and then do a second fight, which is not a thing that the rest of the team can do without actually spending one for hateful assault, I think? Correct. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. So yeah. in comparison, when did you take out the corn anointed versus when did you take out the Nurgle anointed? So, so I took out the corn against uh, Harlequins, and in that matchup, he just sort of held the mid board and their objective and he never actually got to fight i i chased some clowns around um which sort of ended up denying uh a uh, a secondary that helped me make it close that, that that game with me and matt came down to like oh man if, if i can roll three three ups on five dice with a cp reroll, i i can i can score a couple things that'll put me ahead one point and i couldn't so that, that's how tight it was and so he he took it but so he never got to fight and then i also took corn anointed against uh hearthkin but again never came up because he just my uh, my icon bear and my my leader in that matchup were doing most of the work, and he did some cleanup. So, I see. Well, that's interesting. I wouldn't have expected that the corn anointed was one that you would be looking out for. I think generally I hear people talk about the corn butcher versus the Nurgle butcher, just because the corn butcher's eight damage hit is so much bigger than you know the anointed losing the damage reduction. So, if we were going to oh, talk really? about the the next up corn corn Nurgle flip it'd be you know corn butcher versus nurgle butcher you know are there times when you would take one or the other or do you you know are you mostly on nurgle butcher at this point well i as now everybody when everybody gets into legionaries everybody wants to run the butcher right he's the coolest model by far everybody's so psyched on him legionaries are a team i think that if you're getting started with them they have a lot of traps like Warded armor is a piece of equipment that's just like a meme, right? Like it looks really good on paper, but we we actually run it. It's like, oh, this is garbage. Like it gives you a two up save until you take damage. So like you get to roll a two up save once, <laughs> you know, like and the butcher, you want to run him every time, but he's not the pick to run every time. So like I never took the butcher a single time. I never ran into seven wound teams. Um, maybe, maybe he could have come out against Harlequins, but just just didn't end up. Uh, didn't bring or even the the Votan, I think Corn Butcher against Votan because your axe does one. The eight wounds, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so he never came out. But I think totally for sure, if there's an operative in that team that wants to be Corn, it's got to be uh, the Butcher because four, you know, four fours on fours, even with full rerolls, man, sometimes you're not going to get that crit. So Corn assuring you get a crit if you can get a single hit is huge. Yeah. I think Corn Butcher is the the most obvious one that would get taken as Corn, just because the eight damage hit means that you're able to manage a lot of these teams. It's just whether or not the perpetual aggression stuff actually lines up. Yeah, yeah. totally. There was um, one other thing that I wanted to point out about the Butcher, and that is like for um, especially for like Into the Dark, his his little aura of. Uh, being within two inches is considered engagement range. So you, oh, yeah. you like you can't get close enough to just shoot him. You either have to charge him or leave him alone. And like that on its own is just like 
a silent positioning tool that is is just like another super secret weapon. Um, and I just have kind of been chuckling about how awesome that is and figured I'd share that one. Oh, yeah. Like if you put him behind a barricade, you know, far enough back behind yeah. a door, it's like, who's getting through that door? <laughs> Nobody. That's who. Yeah, I think the one big trap for players who are trying to use that rule, I think on the Legionary, <laughs> it is called... Yeah, yeah. So devastating onslaught. For the purposes of dash, fallback, and normal move actions, enemy operatives would perform. Treat the distance of this operative's engagement range as two inches for that action instead of one. So it means that it's hard for you to move into him when he's concealed. But on In the Dark, if you're trying to use this ability behind a closed door, it actually doesn't work. Because what your opponent can do is move into a door, open the door, and they're technically in engagement range, but they're not in engagement range during a shoot action. So I've watched, I have watched a couple of players walk into that trap where they thought that if you put a guy on guard uh, behind a door, that you would be able to get away with a fight before they were allowed to. And someone opened the door just at the range where they were not in actual engagement range and the person sure. wasn't in hatchway fight range and just got ate a plasma to the face. Yeah, so like the Ooh, only way to make good. that work is if you open the door and then park behind it concealed because then they can't approach yeah. the door and then they can't get close enough to ignore your cover from being within two inches and then like that's where the real secret weapon lies there. Yeah, so you've got to be, for anyone who's trying to do this, the butcher has to be visible before any of this basically can happen because they literally can't see them on in the dark right because of a door then this doesn't work because it only counts during the dash fallback and normal move it doesn't count during any of the other stuff so you can actually be within the gap while he's on conceal and shoot him just fine it's just getting into that gap is not normally possible so it's a a big thing that i have seen people miss and that that has nothing to say for you moving your butcher aggressively into people that also doesn't work because yeah yeah they'll shoot you within an inch and a half it has nothing to do with the shoot action so be careful about that for people trying to use a devastating onslaught yeah yeah so like the the exact application there is like um let's say for example you're playing against like star striders for example and they're going to wait until you run out of activations and then they're going to run up to get within two inches of you and then they're going to call like the nuke on you um so if your only guy that's pushed forward enough to be eligible for that play is the butcher they can't run into the range where they can actually target him and now you've got you've got like your foothold to to launch into the enemy team next turn and they just can't do anything about it yeah so good yeah this is definitely uh the, the spot where the butcher shines the hardest is when people are trying to game the two inch distance probably on open specifically for the star striders yeah yeah, and then there's other teams that have like a similar kind of vibe there, but um yeah, so that's that's like the main piece there. Um but yeah, I mean, we do still have uh another piece of the operative showdown that I think would be is a fun one to chat about and that is the icon and do you ever take the icon as Black Legion just for like the the basics, like the double shoot double fight. Oh man, so I be curious as, as as a fellow legionary player, I'd be curious if, if you do or not. But I never take an undivided uh, icon bear. I do. I tell you what, though, the icon with chain sword is quickly becoming one of my like go to operatives. I will like. I know a lot of people don't like dropping the heavy, but I drop the heavy gunner for a chain sword icon with a crack grenade quite often lately, and he has been putting in some work. But I, I never take him undivided, just because I'd rather get a free never injured or free minus one damage and then spend a CP when I need to, because we we're just, you know, legionaries get so much CP anyways. I never find it an issue. How, how about you? Yeah, I feel the same way. And I also like, I always take the Mark of corn icon, um, partially because that banner makes him count as one extra APL. And that is just super clutch all the time, which is, is just amazing. And then the fact that like, he is pretty scary with just a chain sword and like, then he's just another dude that can chain lightning into people. And it's just like, it's ruthless. Yeah. Hear me out though, you know, undivided with the crack grenade. So if you were going to be doing what you're doing, right, you would use your leader to get the free ploy. Cause as long as your leader or your Archon bearer exists, they can both give the free ploy. So undivided gives your crack grenade a reroll, which does help 
as far as the reliability goes for oh, the, yeah totally yeah and he's still yeah, so having banner. like an undivided icon bear with a crack grenade means that you've got a pretty good forward piece that also gives you double fight or double shoot the real question is whether or not people are actually double shooting most of the time and i think at this point i i haven't really seen double shoot come up all that often just because for the most part players don't really give you double shoot it's really the intercessors no. that get away with double shoot because they're they have all their guns that are double shooting because it's not often that you're going to be running a heavy bolter nowadays, so it's really just is your icon bears tainted rounds double shooting yeah. at this point, right? Yeah, the, the double shooters I find are, are the Zinch players because like Zinch is really the only time uh, when the heavy bolter makes more sense than, than the Reaper auto cannon, just math wise. Um, and so I, I know some Zinch guys like to run the icon with with uh, blessed bolts or you know accursed rounds, tainted whatever rounds. it's called. Yeah, yeah, and so. I I don't like that personally because I, I run them very melee focused. I think it's just what they want want to do. But I know the Zinch players like to do it that way with the double shooting. But I agree. Like if you're playing folks who know what's up, like man, you aren't you're not going to get to double shoot unless you're just double shooting an intercessor. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think locally one of the legionary diehards in my group, Will, he has found that double shooting basically never comes up. So he's basically stopped trying to manage the double shooting at all, and now he's just playing super cagey. And he was able to take the W against uh, Michael Sarah, one of our other local players, in our most recent monthly for October. Oh, so. nice! Oh, that rules. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he was playing, you know, void dancers. So maybe uh, I think he's even on the Discord. So in case you want to ask for tips, Ben, maybe the next time you play void dancers, you'll have some extra answers. Look, man, I'll take all the help I can get against those stupid clowns. Yeah, man. <laughs> as far as using other random marks, you know, it sounds like you use corn, so there's no reason, no way for this to have come up. But if you have flirted around with Slanesh, have you ever tried a Slanesh Psyker to try to get away with a cheeky turn one fire blast that your opponent wasn't expecting? Oh, man. So my roster for like about a year now has been Nurgle Slanesh. So, so yeah, I, I, the yes, yes, and no, like, Again, a lot of folks just aren't giving you turn one fire blasts anymore just because people have have learned um, like typically you get a turn one fire blast off the first time someone plays legionaries and then they never let it happen again. But like cultists yeah. or something is probably, probably getting it off. So I really like him as Slanesh, but also I like him as Slanesh for the strat where you get plus one to your crit damage and something that. Oh. Yeah, so I love him actually like into intercessors. His fire blast is doing nothing, but what he is doing is his, his knife is only it's five attacks, three, four with demonic energies. So every time you retain a crit, that's two mortal wounds. So I love sending him into an intercessor because nobody's expecting it. You buff yourself with uh, I forget what it's called, but you give yourself lethal uh, five, brutal, brutal. And lethal five. Yeah, it's yeah, malign and... influence on yourself. Thank you. Yeah. So now and if you're Slanesh and you have the plus one damage. You, effectively, you have a three, three seven melee weapon going into intercessors, and with lethal five, it's not uncommon for you to roll two or maybe even three crits. So that changes the melee maths in a crazy way. So you're killing an intercessor, maybe only taking a hit back. That is that does sound really cool. Yeah, the legionary balefire acolyte. You know, every crit that you retain is dealing two wounds. So if you're doing an extra crit damage because you're slanesh, you are mulching a fourteen wound model. Yeah, and and again, nobody expects it, which is so cool because like you're afraid of him from the balefire, but he can go in and chop it up really good, like single target melee combat. He's an absolute monster. And then like into seven wound models who have the same strength, there he'll just like run up and and one shot people. And that's another thing, like, yeah, no one would expect that. Yeah. And I've actually been using this as a Nash Slyker a little bit more than I would have expected from, you know, hearing all the internet discussion about, you know, which marks to take. Yeah, man, niche tactics has just turned into legionary tactics. So uh, in, the, in, the, in your Discord server, so I'm, I'm yeah, here for it. Yeah. Speaking of niche tactics. This week, we're going to we're going to try it a little different because we just had a new set get spoiled. So we're going to try to look into the future and take our bets and see which which tactic we think is going to come up with these new scouts Ooh. or, you know, even the uh, the dire Avengers and, you know, the, whatever the Eldar Eldar models. So I think this week we're going to have a little bit of fun and uh, just guess and see what we think is going to be fun plays. And we'll see where we're at in uh, whatever the set comes out. And then maybe we'll swing back around, get a wrist or, you know, Russ on and we can see how good our predictions were. 
Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Let's do it. And uh, you mentioned that you were really into the scouts for this one, right? So just as a reminder for listeners, we're going to try to guess which which tactics are going to get played off of the scouts. And the scouts have this uh, block of text, Jason, if you want to read it through for us. <laughs> yeah, the scouts. Armed with a diverse array of weapons, including Astartes shotguns, bolt guns, pistols, sniper rifles, heavy bolters, and missile launchers, these customizable squads are more than capable of tackling the Assyriani threat and the myriad of other crash-landed kill teams now operating in Beta Decima. And right, like, on that statement. note, the uh, the kill zone itself looks like it's going to be a big shake-up in the meta, so like, every single team that is like going to be worth a second look with with how that terrain looks, in my opinion. So I just figured I'd throw that out there, too. Yeah, we've got a million gantries and walkways. So, and <laughs> like, you know, for what it's worth, all the teams in the boxes, you know, maybe they were designed with all these gantries and walkways. So I would, if I were to guess, I would expect, you know, some sort of climbing rope or something, just because it wouldn't be forward deployment without some sort of scouting. Without some sort of rope stuff, right? Yeah, climbing ropes for sure feel like, a, or you know, some sort of, you have the little baby reaver, which looks really cool. So, like, he will have some some zipping around shenanigans. Yeah, yeah. Imagine if that's if that baby reaver was like the grot or like a light version <laughs> of that, just a space marine grot. Dude, that would be sight because there's the grapnel launcher guy, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe maybe that would be tight. Yeah, at be the sweet. very least, you know, he can get up get up and around the platforms with ease. Maybe if maybe he gets something when he does the thing. So unlike the grot, because the grot is really not a combat model, but this guy's got he's got the knife and everything, right? So maybe if he does his special action, he gets some extra rules. Maybe, How many ooh, models maybe, do you maybe a zip charge? Maybe something like a zip charge. I'm I'm dreaming here, but oh, maybe some so sort cool. of zip charge where you get a bonus or something. That'd be sweet. Yeah, 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 like uh, you can you can charge up a vantage with no like vertical penalty or something. Ooh, now we're talking. Mm-hmm. That would be sweet. I would expect that if they have a starty shotguns, they've got to be at least where the exaction squad shotguns are, right? There's no way they're three three shotguns. No way. This is what I'm excited about. I'm glad you brought that up because compendium scouts are four shots on twos doing four four. And you know what? That sounds like it's great for killing stupid eight wound elves. So. <laughs> Uh, I'm all sure. about the sh- all hail the new scout shotgun meta. That's what I'm prepared for. <laughs> yeah, I'm all yeah. about it too. I think I think in comparison to the compendium scouts, those are ten models, right? Yes. So, are we thinking that these will be a ten model team? Almost definitely. What do you guys think? I think so. I guess I am guessing that they. I would be surprised if they were ten models if they were like just better versions of the compendium guys. But I guess they could be. I don't know. There, I looking at the weapon loadout. It sounds like a ton of heavy weapons. So that's probably my biggest worry about what they're putting out on this. this I'm going message. to assume you get like two heavy weapons, and you could take two missile launchers or two heavy bolters or one of each, and then the the rest is just like you know your sniper's a specialist, and like it kind of looks like it's going to be. I mean, like like the. The striking scorpions don't really look like they're super complicated. It kind of just looks like a bunch of elves with chain swords and and shuriken pistols. And like if if that's like GW going in the exact opposite direction of Felgor Ravagers, where like every single model was a specialist, and like it's a cool, fun team, <laughs> but it's like it's a whole you gotta like be in a very balanced mental state to be ready to like think about all the different rules you need to remember for Felgor Ravagers. And if these are just like a couple simpler teams and there's like, you know, like, and the scouts equivalent is you've got um, a bunch of warriors, but like you can flavor them out if you want to give them bolt guns or knives or shotguns or whatever. So it feels a little more customized. Like I think that would be a sick direction to go and I'm excited and, and hoping that that's what it is. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping yeah. to get like suspensors or something just so that you can actually get into position to actually use some of these heavy weapons. I was just about to bring that up because scouts really don't get suspensor systems that that that's more of a full fledged Astartes thing. Oh, that's not in like in the lore. It's not allowed. It's like a power armor thing. Yeah. So if you're just just, you know, out there with, uh, you know, your basic scout equipment, I don't think you're going to get suspensors. Ooh. So maybe they've got forward deploys like sneaky. Really sick if you could forward deploy and charge, right? 
Maybe the grapnel guy is allowed to go forward and he can zip over and stab someone super early. Yeah. That'd be nice. If, if there's one thing that we've all learned this summer is that Kill Team needs more forward deploys. Am I right, boys? Hey. <laughs> We've learned Sneaky we've learned that you know one is not enough. It's three that really breaks the game. <laughs> yeah, and three you know minimum. What? Let's be honest. Yeah, scouts. Why not all ten? Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't even respect a forward deploy if you can't put out three guys. Like, let's just be honest. Oh man, what do you guys think some of the ploys or attack ops might be? Or they tactical did, ploys. They don't get shoot or fight twice if, if this edition is anything to go off of. So it'd be really interesting. Yeah, they definitely can't do it as like a strap ploy right because that would be like the big brother thing there's no way yeah. that you could have the same ploys as your astartes big brothers totally yeah so i i really have a i'm having a hard time speculating for what these guys will have i don't know if you guys are feeling the same way but i just like man i'm not totally sure aside from the scouting stuff yeah i would assume that they've got to mess around with scouting a little bit right just because they're because they've got to be forward deployed. Because I think for the teams that do kind of like forward deploy shenanigans, like Wormblade, Commandos, Hunterclade, they all kind of do stuff early on. And Hunterclade maybe are the biggest example of getting to do a bunch of extra scouting actions because they get extra infiltrates or extra dashes. So maybe the scouts will have something like that. I agree. That'd be cool. Yeah. And like, like grab shoot insertion kind of vibes like Phobos has. Um, Ooh, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if they had some kind of like turn one ambush mechanic where they can like change orders on turn one um, to like spring out at people and uh, either that or like striking scorpions. I'm, I'm not like as familiar with the striking scorpion lore, but just like striking scorpion makes me feel like you get close and they lash out and sting you. <laughs> yeah, I think in lore, they're like the forward deploy and heavy armor and stab people in the shadows. Group. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting because think... you have them. There will also be the Howling Banshees and the Dire Avengers. Dire Avengers. Yeah, in there. I think they so that you can mix all three. Yeah, so that'll be. It almost feels like again, sort of like you were you're mentioning, Jason, that there's really not at least <sighs> on the surface doesn't look like much flavor there. It's just ten green dudes with chain swords. One has a lobster claw. So it kind of feels like intercession in in that way. Where okay, maybe it is an easy entry point for folks to play at like strong aspect warriors, but not get not have to get too bogged down in in rules. Yeah. And especially if like all the basic different like all the basic warriors are options like your list building is now just like what equipment do you give your warriors? It's probably going to be a, a lot about roster or like operative selection, right? So maybe kind of a Phobos situation where you're picking between the three aspects for the mission and some people will just play all in cursors or all howling banshees. And some people will do other things. Yeah. And I, I bet that there will be sort of how, you know, how legionaries have ploys for the different marks. I bet that there will be different ploys for the different aspect warriors. Ooh, I like that. I hope That'd so. Cool. And maybe then they'll do cheese. something. Maybe oh, they'll, go ahead. I think they mentioned that there's going to be like a little bit of mixing, right? So maybe they'll have some nod towards, you know, a couple fi- as- aspects working together. Yeah, I was just uh, talking to Dakota on Squad Games. I know, sponsor of you guys. Uh, and we, we were just chatting about, because um, he's a big Eldar fan. You know, he loves the dirty Eldar. So uh, uh, Howling Banshees, their thing in 40K is they always get to fight first. That's a big part of their in-game oh, lore. Man. So, like, I bet there will be, he was even mentioning, like, a team-wide fight first. Like, that's like a... a that that's, insane. That, that would be worse than, like, at launch Felgor. Like, it'd be just insanity. Um, so Especially if you got 10 Howling Banshees, it would just like run up and just yeah. wait for you to get in combat. A whole yeah. team of Shrive Talons that sounds like my nightmare. So, oh, yeah. but I bet it'll be a ploy like maybe if someone charges you, you get to be the attacker or something. That would be really cool. And they've probably got to also have some nod. I mean, maybe Eldari agility lets you just fly on top of a building. So, who knows? Maybe Void Dancers will just be gross with how many <laughs> climb checks to jump test people are looking at. Oh, yeah, man. The new, the new wonky terrain. How, how do you guys feel about that? Because I cannot see a way to make that competitive. <laughs> exactly. What, what do you guys think? I It depends on how much cover there ends up being on top of those buildings. Because I think in the demo pictures, maybe it's fine because you can hide behind all of the objects. And maybe it's fine. But I assume there's probably got to be some other rule with the kill zone. Maybe they have extra obscurity rules or something. Just... From the way that smoke looks, maybe it does something. Sure. 
or like yeah. the seas flare up and it reduces everyone's shooting range to six or something. Um, I don't know. That sounds more like a narrative thing, though. Um, I just like I am not a hundred percent ready to like bad mouth it in any way. I mean, I I feel like even just as is, if it is just a shooting gallery, it's like everyone skirts around like the feet of the buildings until like someone has to go up to to score or something, and then like that just turns into like a giant unraveling thread where like this person shoots at the person on the on the balcony, and then someone like shoots down at everyone and just like turns into a crazy shootout, which. You know, like when when Kill Team first came out, I don't know about about you, but like pretty much every game was that way. Um, and like people weren't doing terrain right and all sorts of stuff like that. And and like if this terrain kit just kind of brought it back to that. But with everything we've learned in the last two years, I think that could be kind of amusing, actually. It's like, look at all these things we've learned. It could also be that, you know, maybe they tone down some of the gantry stuff and because, like, the gantries, I think if you, like, flip them over onto their side, they would make for fine heavy wall cover, right? So maybe if they have to re redo the terrain layouts, they could do that. But I think that I need to play on it just to have a real opinion. Because right now I'm just looking at pictures. I have no idea what those maps look like, so. Yeah, and what what, what they showed off might not be the actual layouts for, you know. Yeah, I think so. that's definitely a thing that has come up. This, that's the thing that's come up in past previews right where they were like showing illegal team layouts yeah yeah so i i think generally what they do with the pictures for previews is they're trying to show all the contents of the boxes so maybe you know maybe there's some other stuff going on with the terrain that we don't know so i'll hold my breath i don't love it but it looks way easier to set up than in the dark so i guess on that part (laughs) i am happy about that that's true yep I mean, for what it's worth, at this point, a year and a half, like a year in, I'm pretty good at setting them up. Maybe not as fast as the T.O. Ben from Tampa, but I can set up the boards pretty quick now. Oh, man, I got a crash course. And yeah, Ben, ben he was awesome at Tampa, by the way. Got to give him a shout out. He's just it was my first time at an event that he was T.O.ing and just what what a total right. pro. Yeah, what a total pro. But no, I got a kill team open this past year. I got a crash course on assembling into the dark terrain out in the tent it was the night before so the the heat wasn't on uh so so florida boy ben out in the tent at night before the heaters come on with these cold fingers like numb fingers and you know what hurts extra bad when your fingers are cold when you skim like the corner of one of the top pieces with one of your cuticles that hurts real bad so i got a crash course then so i'm a pro at it now i've been in the trenches i'm a pro yeah, my tip for any listeners who've made it this far, <laughs> now that we're wandering around the in the dark boards, uh, <laughs> my big tip for setting up in the dark boards is setting up all of the B3 pieces, which are the ones with corners and doors, where the map tells you to do it right away, because those are the easiest to see and sort. And then you can kind of like piece around those and never, ever put on the caps before you've laid out all of your wall segments. Because <laughs> the moment you put on a cap, you're going to screw yourself up, because I literally just did this in October. Yeah. I was like telling Joey, who got, I think, fourth at Tampa and was playing in the finals against Adrian. I was telling him, like, never put on the caps. I'm like staring at this board for 10 minutes. And I'm like, you know what? Maybe I should take off all the caps. I pull off a cap. I'm like, ah, there's the piece. I'm the dumb. <laughs> it was me. It happens to all of us. Yeah. So I would suggest, you know, do the do the B3s because they're easy and never put the caps on until you have laid out all the pieces and then put them all together and then put the caps on. Yeah, and actually, I have one little, like, hack to add on to that. Um, Every single one of those, like, triangle connections on the ends of the walls and, like, the little, like, triangle end pieces um, are one of two ways. And if you just color code them, so, like, on all of my Into the Dark sets, I have all of them that face one way blue and all of them that face one way red. And then if you match colors, if you put red on red, it goes, um, it's a straight through connection. And if you put blue on blue, it's a straight through connection. And if you put um, blue on red, it's a 90 degree connection. And then you, like, when you have everything set up, you can see the blues and reds. And then you know exactly which little, like, triangle end pieces you need. And then you put the caps on it and then it covers the red and the blue so it doesn't mess up your paint scheme. Um, oh that's a pro tip that's that's an actual genius tip i didn't even think about that yeah my my quick speed paint for the in the dark sets paints them up in like two hours and over like two coats of paint and that's like i pre-assemble four walls and then i spray coat them and then i do another like zenithal on top and then i sponge to get everything messed up 
So Ooh, it nice. leads together. So they come together pretty quick, but that's a good tip. I, Cause I definitely pre-sort the in the dark before that, but who knows maybe after this comes out, I won't have to build or paint any in the dark sets going for. <laughs> I, speaking of painting into the dark, I just uh, painted my first part of an. I, I've never painted into the dark set because uh, I'm lucky enough to have other folks who who volunteered to do it in my stead, which is awesome. But I painted a wall. Part of my display board uh, for Tampa was an in, an into the dark wall, and so that was my first time painting it. And uh, uh, so it was fun to do one stretch, and uh, but man, to do a whole set would be would be a little a little annoying. Oh, there's yeah. just so many details my, you can pick out. My goal was a speed paint, so it's like I'm trying to make it look messy and lived in, so it's pretty easy. But if anyone wants to see pictures of Ben's board, they'll be up on Goonhammer for his as part of the best painted Ooh. part of the Tampa Open article. Oh yeah, I'm excited! Excited, excited to uh, to be on on the hallowed grounds of uh, Goonhammer. That's like yeah. hol- hol- e- e- not for being good at the game, but just for being <laughs> just, just for being there <laughs> feels good. Honestly, being a writer for Goonhammer or being one of the writers for Goonhammer is kind of crazy to me because I remember reading Goonhammer for 2018 and being like, man, this is this is it. <laughs> That's where you and go. I'm like, writing articles for them. So it's cool. Every time, every single time I play Necromunda, I pull up the Goonhammer uh, Cador article <laughs> every single time. Like, OK, <laughs> walk me through this, please. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think locally we've even got. I think Necromunda has filled up for the New York Open, and BattleTech has filled up as our side events. So, you know, for oh, anyone no looking That's to cool. come to New York Open, you know, it's just the GT at this point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How rolls. about uh, how about how are things coming for the Renegade Wargaming Convention? Renegade is coming along. Um, we've got two events that we are going to be running. Um, so Renegade is a, it's a wargaming convention. There's all sorts of stuff there. There's Sigmar. Um, they might have Warcry, maybe not. Um, and then there's 40k. There's even like bolt action in the Batman game. Um, and the the November iteration specifically, we rent out a whole hotel, and um, yeah, so it's like it's the biggest one of the year. Um, our Friday event is going to be Escape the Gallow Dark, and as I, I, I'm still kind of like scheming with some ideas of bringing some speakers and lights and like playing the Doom soundtrack and having like spinning red lights Ooh. and uh, like shine a flashlight at your end of the dark, and there's all this like crazy effects that can happen that um, my friend Lee is putting together. So it's like you you roll initiative on a d20, and then it could be like um, gravity goes out, and now everyone can fly, or like the lights go out, and now you can't oh, see past man. four inches, or like there's a gravity slam, and everyone moves into like the east wall, um, or like um, objective markers can explode, and then it just kills everyone that's on there, or like um, an air leak, and then it slams Explosive all doors. Compression on a room, just yeah. Like- blow a room up and then all the doors slam shut yep so we've got all sorts of crazy effects like that um we've been doing a lot of play testing for that over the last um month month and a half um and just kind of getting that all put together um it's been a lot of fun um so that's the friday event and then it's yeah so it's kind of like a narrative thing and then um saturday and sunday is going to be linked like a, a grand tournament um we're we're still taking signups and I actually haven't checked on the numbers in a little while, but um, we're we're shooting for hoping to get like at least 24 players. And then if we do fill that up, then I'm going to request to see if we can get a little more space. But um, we'll see how it all goes. Well, that sounds awesome, man. Yeah, yeah. it sounds like, you know, you've got Ben, you've also got something of a similar scale coming up. Are you doing four rounds or three rounds if you have 36 people show up at the next uh, Warfire game tournament? So we have we always do four rounds, um, and Eve. So I think in the past, the past two that we've done, even so we've had like twenty two, twenty four folks, and even then there ends up. Or I think it's twenty and twenty two, and uh, like even that we've ended up with two undefeated players, which is a bit of a bummer. Um, mm. But uh, but definitely four rounds for for thirty six. Um, and ideally, we're we're at, we're at Warp Fire. We'll be moving into a new location, just like you know, half a mile down the road. So at that point, we can probably fit up to oh man, like I, I don't I don't want to count the tables before we have them, but even up to like forty eight, even maybe sixty players, if we wanted to really pack them in. So you know, hopefully, hopefully the the Florida scene will continue to grow, and and we can max out and do some two days. 
It definitely sounds like uh, being an hour away from anything that's worth doing is coming at coming back in spades in this case, huh? Oh yeah, man. Ocala again. Not not much here other than the Warp Fire tournaments, but uh, but it's good because like the Miami guys, it's a drive for them, but uh, everybody else is not too bad for. Her. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that sounds really exciting. Being able to have like uh, basically a, a full GT regularly, you know, I, in New York at Brooklyn, we've gotten up to thirty-two with our doubles tournaments. But I don't generally run four or five rounds just because I think people would just want to come and have fun. So I generally run three rounds, and I give the last two players their the Duke battle for first place, basically, and then I just run as a top cut on BCP a little bit later. That's cool. Yeah, I'll have to pick your pick your brain on on doubles tournaments because that's something that I'd I want to throw in again just for a little more a little more relaxed, a little more fun for some folks. So I'll have to ask you some questions on that later. Yeah, I think there's a you know we've had I think the last podcast we had Kirill on. He talked about his team tournament in Russia, which sounded fun. We've done doubles with fun rules and doubles without fun rules, and you know obviously Dakota has done the biggest of the team tournaments in the yeah. US. So we've got no shortage of team team stuff. Yeah, sounds super fun. It is it is pretty cool. I think the way I tried to ramp things up for mine was to have uh basically fun rules show up rather than it being completely serious. So I think the last round was uh switch a third of your team. So one of your thirds of deployment you would switch with your friend. And that was cool. Ooh, that's fun. Yeah, I like that. All right. Well, Ben, any other shout outs before we uh, split for the day? Oh, yeah, man. Uh, shout outs. I'm a shout out machine. So we got uh, starting off with Warp Fire Minis. Uh, I, I work there. But um, before I worked there, I was a patron there. Awesome prices on, on Warhammer stuff on the U.S. Free shipping over $50 with GW prices. Everything is over $50 these days. So it's basically free shipping on almost anything. Uh, and uh, you can check them out at WarfireMinis.com. And then uh, I do a podcast with my two two good buds, Reese and Russ, Kill Team Casuals, where we seem to be getting less casual by the episode, but uh, but we're, we're, we're working on it. And uh, you can check it. You find that anywhere podcasts are. And uh, then I have a YouTube channel that has been a little inactive lately just because I've been focusing on sort of building the, the Florida scene up. But that's Battle Brothers Tabletop. Uh, hoping to get some some new content up on there as the new edition comes or the new season comes out. So so I think I think that's all my plugs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, squad games are Dakota for our just another kill team gauge. You know, you mentioned them earlier on the podcast and they are still one of our sponsors. So if anybody wants one of those gauges, go on down and grab, grab one. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, speaking of like kill team content, you know, Russ, I use Russ's channel as like the default for like, if you want more competitive gameplay, that would be that would be Russ. So I'm not surprised that you guys keep edging towards more competitive games. Yeah, man, we're we're leaving Reese in the dust a little bit, but we're we're trying to bring him up by proxy a little bit. Yeah. Is he part of the Sydney scene? Uh, I don't know if he he's got a got a, a new babe, a new baby. Um, so uh, I'm not sure he he gets out a ton, but I, I know that he has uh, he's messaged. So talked to some of those guys a little bit, but uh, we got to get him out there, man. We got to we got to get the bird out of the nest. Get, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, get him playing some comps and uh, gotta switch over from kill team casuals to kill team competitors. competitors. Ooh, that, that'd be an easy switch. That's a good one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Well. You know, we talked about uh, plenty of legionary things. You got a Slanesh Psyker, which I wasn't expecting. I'll be honest. I thought yeah, I threw that in kind of as like uh, for Funzie's joke, but it was cool to hear a good strategy for it. I actually do think it sounds like a good idea for some maps and some layouts. Yeah, totally. Not every time, but like against intercessors on certain maps. Oh, I love it. Oh, yeah. If you really want to crack the power armor, right? Because, yeah, there's just no defense if you hit a bunch of crits. Yeah, there's nothing you can do. You just die. <laughs> I mean, it works against Nurgle, too, right? Where if you run in and you get the, like, two or three crits, you could actually just one-shot them before anything happens. Absolutely, yeah. It's happened. I, I, I have one-shotted Intercessors and Legionaries with him. Um, again, you have to roll good. That's the, <laughs> you're, you're, you're hoping all the roll's good, but when it happens, yeah. oh, man, you feel like the king of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, you know, we talked a little bit about the new releases, just because, you know, they, they're on everyone's mind. You know, we'll see how the terrain shows up, right? Yeah, man, I think you guys made a good uh, a good point. Like we we haven't seen the rules yet, so 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 many folks like to jump straight to the negativity. And the kill team rules crew, I'm of the opinion that man, they they kill it nine out of ten times. Even I'll say this: like ninety five percent of the time, they're killing it. 
and uh and there are some anomalies that happen but you know everybody's human uh so i think if if they didn't get it exactly right what we do know is in a couple months they will get it right they'll make the tweaks they, they're killing yeah, it for I, me i mean pre in the dark or pre crit op in the dark is very different from post crit op in the dark also so i really am not super worried about it if they have some weirdness i'm sure that it'll be changed in time yeah totally i agree yeah i've got high hopes i'm very excited about it and eager to see where it takes us all right ben thanks for coming on oh thanks for having me guys it's been a pleasure yeah and thank you listeners for listening until the end